remain standing as today we read from the second chapter of the book of Acts. Let us hear these holy words about the early church. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed together were in one place and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as they had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. We well, again say we're to welcome all of you this morning. We're certainly thankful for your presence, those watching on television and online, and certainly those of you here in the sanctuary. We appreciate very much you being here today as we begin a new series of sermons entitled, Why Do United Methodists? Today we talk about why do United Methodists worship? We say a special word of greeting to those in Monticello and Glenwood, as well as Center Ridge. We're thankful for your presence as well as those who are in our respective hospitals, who are, those who are homebound across the state as well. If you would, those here in the sanctuary, turn to the back of your order of service. On the back, you'll see announcements of upcoming activities taking place in the life of the church. I want you to notice down in the left-hand bottom corner the name Alistair McGrath. Alistair McGrath is the premier C.S. Lewis scholar in the world. He is a professor at Oxford. He is a former atheist. I think he has three PhDs, and he is a devout Christian. He is going to be our rainy series speaker in December, and I promise you, you will not want to miss it. I've read many, many of his books. He's authored more than 50 books. He is a devout Christian and is going to come and speak to us, and it will be a big, big event for us. And that field, for us to be able to get someone of this quality, is extraordinary, you all. I'm talking about a big name. This guy in the world in which he lives is the Beatles. He's Elvis Presley. And he's coming to Pulaski Heights. So please go ahead and mark those dates on your calendar. Obviously, more information is forthcoming. We want you to be aware of that. We also want to remind you, of course, that this week starts all of the different activities in the life of the church, small groups, Bible studies, book studies, et cetera, et cetera. Please be aware of that. I am teaching a Bible study on Wednesday evening for our Wednesday evening activities, as we usually do. But I'm also teaching the same study at 10 a.m., on Wednesday mornings for those who choose not to travel in the evening. So if you're interested, I hope you'll consider being a part of that. Lots of things happening in the life of the church. We want you to be a part of all of it. We're grateful that you're here. Let us pray. Oh Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien are two of the premier writers of the 20th century. We know about the Narnia series written by Lewis and the Lord of the Rings series written by Tolkien. J.R.R. Tolkien was a major influence in C.S. Lewis becoming a Christian. They were both academics at Oxford. They were friends, colleagues, and devout followers of Jesus Christ. They were a part of a group that they named the Inklings. The Inklings were different professors at Oxford who would gather together on a regular basis at the Eagle and Child pub to have a few pints and to talk about life, to talk about the books they were reading, the books they were writing, having fellow academics crit critique their writings and giving feedback. They talked about current events and they talked about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ, particularly during the Second World War. These two men found great solace with the Inklings. They found as though a place where they belonged they felt as though they were the kind of people in the group who could surround themselves with one another 
in Christian love. This is where they had fellowship. This is where they belonged. This is where they recognized the sacred worth of each individual in the group in a pub over a few pints on a regular basis. It sounds a lot like worship, does it not? Now, we may not have a few pints together in our worship experience, but just like Lewis and Tolkien and the others who made up the Inklings, we are a part of a group where we find out we belong, where we feel a sense of fellowship and connection to those around us, where we can talk theology, if you will, where we pray together and we sing together and we listen together and we converse with one another together. That's what it means to be a part of the life of the church. And fundamentally, that's what worship is all about. It goes back to the early days of the church when they gathered together, oftentimes over a meal, to find a place in the midst of disruption and uncertainty where they could belong, where they were somebody, where they mattered. By definition, worship means to ascribe worth, to place someone or something above all else. We believe in the life of the church, of course, that that is the God we know in and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we ascribe worth to Jesus Christ. We elevate him above everybody else. He's not just a celebrity figure. He's not a political figure. He's not just an influential figure. He is God in flesh, the one before whom we bow. And so when we gather together to worship, we recognize that this one we know to be Jesus Christ is one who is above all others. We ascribe worth to him above everyone and everything else. And the good news is when we gather together, we can come just as we are. For many of us, we come broken. For all of us, we are at least cracked in some way. And every one of us, when we gather here with all of our imperfections and our sin, our shortcomings and our failures and our successes and our victories, gather in this place and when we worship, something happens to us. We begin to realize that we belong, that we matter, that those around us, as imperfect as they may be, are sacred in the eyes of not only God, but all of us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, something happens when we gather together that enables us to know this is the group with whom we want to belong. William Sloan Coffin, the famous preacher at Riverside Church in New York City, said one time, I hear people say that the church is a crutch. Well, of course it's a crutch. What makes you think you don't limp? Every one of us, when we come in here, in some way limp, right? The church is a crutch. It holds us up when we would otherwise fall. And the good news is when we gather together to worship and we ascribe worth, this is where we find community. This is where we find hope and assurance. And we know that ultimately we find victory. I think one of the great things about worship, whatever our style of worship may be, and there are all kinds of different styles of worship, in the United Methodist Church, we tend to have two styles, if you will, though some churches have many others. We have what we call classic or traditional worship, like we have here with an organ and a choir and liturgy and robes and all of those kinds of things. And we also have what we call modern worship with drums and guitars and praise music. And people choose to go to one or the other, and some actually go to both every week. Because in that moment, when they gather together, whatever style of worship it is, they think something happens to them or they wouldn't be here otherwise. And we believe by the power of Holy Spirit, something does happen to us. And I think if any of us just take a few moments every single day in life, and reflect on what God has done for us. We cannot help but want to be a part of worship. We cannot help but want to praise our God, whatever that style of worship looks like. 
there is something fundamental about worship because it is a visceral response to God for what God has done for us. Worship is not entertainment. Worship is not one sitting in a pew waiting for someone else to somehow fill an hour out of their lives for them. Worship is a participatory event where all of us are a part of the experience, and God is the audience. It is a visceral, physical, emotional, and spiritual response to who God is in our life, and something happens every time we worship. Something takes place, and we realize we belong. We are reminded once again that we believe in a God of grace who affords us another opportunity and another chance. And we're changed. I appreciate so much what Jean Vanier said. He said, we do not discover who we are. We do not reach true humanness in a solitary state. William Willimon said, the church allows us to be more than we could ever be if left to our own devices. Something happens when we worship. We're so much more than we would be alone. We're so much more when we're a part of a community where we belong, where we feel that sense of intimacy, and we respond with praise and thanksgiving in whatever style of worship we choose to participate in. Over my years in ministry and my years of getting longer and longer, I have had people say to me in a variety of ways, they'll see me somewhere, and of course, they want to justify why they're not in church. Like, I want to know why they're not in church. I may be out on the golf course in the grocery store or somewhere else, but they rush to me to tell me and give excuses why they're not here. And more often than not, people will say something like, I just don't get much out of it. Really? That makes me feel real warm inside. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> and my response is always the same. You participate in things all the time you don't get much out of, but you do it because you have to do it, because you have no choice. You know, I was thinking about things in life that we don't get much out of, but we have to do it. I think about Susan, my wife, who goes to the grocery store probably 20 times for my every one time. She has to go two or three times a week. Now, I know doing that day after day, week after week, and year after year, you probably don't get a lot out of it. It's not as exciting and maybe as it was at one time going to the grocery store. But you go to the grocery store for the well-being of your family and for yourself, right? You may not get much out of it but in terms of being emotionally connected to the experience, but you got to do it. I cannot tell you how many times I have had my oil changed and my tires rotated, and I don't get anything out of it, but I got to do it. You know why? Because I drive a vehicle that requires that, and for the well-being of those, particularly me, who happen to be driving that car, it is important that we do that. I don't get much out of it. I don't even want to do it, but I have to do it. We know what that's like. Think about a parent who from the time a child is born into the world until that child is potty trained, parents will change thousands of diapers. Now they probably don't get much out of it. You know, at first it's real cute. I remember when our kids were a little tiny. Oh, that's so cute. Isn't that cute? And after a while it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you don't get much out of it, but you have to do it. For the well-being of the child, you have to do it. There are lots of things in life that we may not get a whole lot out of, but we got to do it, including worship. I know that every time you come here, every Sunday, you don't leave in a state of euphoria. I get that. But you got to do it because it's who you are. It's for your well-being. It's for the well-being of those who are around you who participate in your life. When we gather to worship, it is because we must do it. We have no choice. It is part of who we are. That's what United Methodists do, and that's why United Methodists worship, because we have to. It's for our own well-being. We must. Paul says, present your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. It is your true worship. You know what Paul means by that? He means that you give your whole self, your whole self to God. That is true worship. Your total being, 
your complete self. And when we do that, something extraordinary happens to us. We may not always feel it, but it becomes a part of who we are. And it becomes a requirement. It is a necessity in our lives. All these years in ministry, I cannot tell you just hundreds, maybe even thousands of times in worship. I have been up here, if you will, looking out over a respective congregation and I know the story of some of the people sitting out there. I know how life has broken them. I know how filled with pain they are. I know that sometimes they're even angry with God. And they're here. I am in awe of that. You know why they're here? Not because they have to be but because they have to be. I know people, because of who they are, have been rejected by their family, have been rejected by society, and oftentimes have even been rejected by the church. And they're here, worshiping. They don't have to be but they have to be. I know mom and dads who get up early on Sunday morning, get their children out of bed, make sure their children have something for breakfast, get their children dressed, get the children in the car, and they come and they sit and worship with their children, and they open up the hymnals, and they teach the child how to sing the hymns, and they point at the order of service, and they run their finger across, showing the child what it is we're saying and why we're saying it. You know, they don't have to do that, but they have to do that. I know people in this church who get everything ready for a worship experience in the sanctuary. I know people who clean up after we're gone every Sunday here in this sanctuary. I know people who sing in the choir. I know people who usher. I know people who just stick out a hand and welcome someone. We're glad you're here. Now, they don't have to do that, but they have to do that. That's what worship is all about. We don't have to be here. Nobody's making us come. Our government doesn't force us to do this. We don't have to. But by golly, we have to. That's what United Methodists believe. We have to worship. It is part of who we are. Back in the old days, you all, we were called shouting Methodist. Did you know that? We were literally called shouting Methodist. Now, listen, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, don't shout while I'm preaching, okay? <laughs> Unless it's an amen and preacher, keep going, you're wonderful. You can shout all that you want. But our style of worship may have changed, but our mindset, our motivation is just the same. You think about it. United Methodists across the world have worshipped through wars. United Methodist Christians have worshipped through economic downturns. United Methodist Christians, along with the rest of the Christian world, have worshipped through a pandemic. And we're still doing it. And why are we doing it? Because we have to. That's what worship is all about. It is a visceral response to what God has done for us in and through Jesus Christ, where we have to be here. The University of Michigan, several years ago, had a philanthropy panel study. And they studied people, two types, those who went to Christian worship more often than not, and those who were very irregular. In both instances, they talked to people who claimed to be members of churches, some who went regularly and some who didn't. And they discovered that people who attend worship regularly are healthier, 
physically or more generous. In fact, they're 17 times more generous than an irregular attender. They feel a sense of community and feel a sense of self-confidence to a much greater degree those who attend regularly than those who don't. Now, because of technology, we count, of course, and we should, those people who attend with us on television or online, particularly those who are distanced from us. Because many of those people feel a sense of community with us and they feel like they belong and they do and they should. There's something about worship that's just good for us. It's healthy. It's right. It's what we need because it's who we are. See, here's the bottom line in all of this. Why do United Methodists worship? Because we have to. I mean, we don't have to, but we have to. Hallelujah. Amen.